Okay, great. Welcome everyone. I'm so happy to see everyone to our Wednesday night well of being. And tonight we have Chandra Lopan Chandra Easton teaching and we're working through our um, Lojong sayings. And I have a couple of announcements. I'm Mace, I'm a um, volunteer. And I will put drop in the chat um, uh, a link so that you can look at the calendar for the Dharma Collective. But we do have cool two cool things coming up. Um, George Haas is going to be on Friday talking about a book that he wrote um, called The Lower Manhattan Dormitory Effect, a memoir of 1979 New York in photographs and lyric prose poetry. Um, so that is happening, I believe it's this Friday night. Um, and then there's also a, um, a new course series on by Mimi, I'm not quite sure you how to pronounce her name, Mona Sierra, Moniker, um, uh, for new meditators. Um, does anyone know how to pronounce her last name? No. Okay. Um, and then finally, you can look at the link that I'll drop in the chat in a minute um, for more things on the calendar. We have tons of regular events, as you all know. And you also know that we run the collective on volunteer work and the donations of our Sangha members. And we try really hard to help support our teachers. And so anything that you can give is deeply appreciated. We also very much understand that this pandemic is taking a long-term significant toll on people's finances. Um, so we, you're welcome regardless, um, always, and your generosity and your ability to donate is also very appreciated. And I'll drop those links, the virtual donation links in the box, in the chat box. So we're really glad you're all here. Thanks, Mace. Thanks, Jason, for moderating. And uh, it's good to see you all. I, I know last week we said it would be Eve tonight, but something came up, and so she asked me if I would sub. So I'm Eve's, Eve's sub <laughs> tonight, and she should be back next week. And, and then the last Wednesday of this month, I will offer a Feeding Your Demons guided practice. So new and experienced people are all welcome. It's a wonderful five-step meditation process to work with challenging emotions, thought patterns, and so on, areas where you feel stuck in your life or your meditation practice. It's a really wonderful tool for meditators. Um, it's actually kind of fun, which you might not think. <laughs> Usually my be like, yeah, tonight let's go feed my demons, you know. But it actually uh, is a quite a beautiful and profound uh, practice. And then we also meet our ally or allies. So we feed the demons, we meet the allies, and uh, we learn a lot about ourselves. And in fact, it's a practice that's very good for the topic that we're going to explore tonight, the 27th slogan, uh, which is about working with our challenging emotions. So I'll unpack that more after we practice. So why don't we all go ahead and find a comfortable seat and you can look away from the computer. You can take a supine position if you like meditating lying down at the end of the day. Um, I know I do because I have uh, some, you know, pretty consistent, uh, my best friend here is my low back. <laughs> it's a constant companion. And I've learned to not be shy about meditating lying down anymore. I was try to let go of any kind of ideal there where we think that we can only meditate if we're upright the trick is to not fall asleep right so one trick when you're lying down meditating is to take your your upper arm and and rest it on the floor next to you with a forearm perpendicular to the floor aligned with gravity so it doesn't take much energy to hold it up and then if you fall asleep it'll kind of f slap the floor and wake you up i also like to meditate gazing at the ceiling if i'm lying down and that just a nice, gentle, soft gaze, but with the eyes slightly open, helps to avoid falling asleep. In any case, whether you're upright or supine, standing or walking, the most important thing is to have your spine straight and let the musculature of the body feel relaxed and aligned with gravity. So let's drop in and allow the eyes to close and begin by taking a few deep breaths. Mm. 
Releasing tension with the out breath. These first few moments of breathing can be deliberate, nice, deep, luxurious breaths so that then you can release any tension of the day <clears throat> with the out breath. I even like to nod my head a little bit, release any tension that I'm holding in my neck or shoulders, jaw, face. Relax the jaw. And feel the chest kind of buoyant, lifted slightly, but the shoulders are down and back. <clears throat> and feel the belly soft. If you have a tight waistline around your belly, loosen that so that the breath can really fill the, <clears throat> the vase, the hara the bowl of your pelvis. Release tension around the hips, the low back with the out breath. Take a moment to arouse a heartfelt motivation for your practice. This is classically called your bodhicitta prayer, the aspiration to awaken, to evolve, to heal for the benefit of yourself and others. The twofold bodhicitta is for self and others. feel that quality of spaciousness within the body as the breath travels in and out. And let the mind alight upon the breath like a horse and a rider. The mind is the rider on the horse of the breath. Riding the breath in and out <clears throat> without losing contact with that flow of the in and the out breath, the full cycle of the inflow and the outflow. Soothing the body and the mind with each out breath. Clarifying, awakening, brightening the attention with the in breath. <clears throat> Notice if you're holding a heavy load, a burden from your day, from your life, your work, your relationships. Notice if it's feeling like you're carrying a, a heavy load. And <clears throat> with the out breath feel, you can even make a gesture with the hands, letting that load come down off your shoulders and placing it on the earth, your cushion, the desk, whatever's in front of you, just put it down. Just feel that heavy load melting off of your shoulders and offer it back to the earth. The earth can carry this right now for you. And thank the earth. Like the Buddha reaching down and touching the earth when Mara asked him, what right do you have to claim your own destiny, your awakening? And the Buddha said, through lifetimes I've practiced, the earth is my witness. And he touched the earth and it trembled. Feel that. The earth is your witness, your friend, through lifetime after lifetime.
And then return to this wonderful flow of the in and out breath, a little lighter, less burdened, more present. Give yourself the gift of that presence. You've earned it. You're here now with me, with the group. So let's encourage the mind to stop its fantasizing, its rumination, its planning, and invite it to drink from the well of being within you. With each breath, it's as if you're ladling the well, you're sipping the water from the well, <clears throat> nourishing your body, nourishing your mind, your heart, your soul. Nourishing with the in-breath, clarifying, enlivening with the in-breath. Relaxing, integrating with the out-breath. I'll offer a little koan, a gatha from not Han, with the in-breath you could say, I have arrived, with the out-breath, I am home. Internally, I, am al I have arrived, as you inhale, as you exhale, I am home. Really feel the meaning of these words suffuse your body-mind. And how does it feel to arrive home within yourself? To really be at home. Comfort, quiet, a feeling of belonging. No more searching, no more wandering. You're home now. Let the out-breath soften into a deeper feather bed of home feeling of soft, warm. Releasing tension, releasing distraction with the out-breath.
without losing that sense of presence, that stability and comfort within. Gently open the eyes, gazing at a comfortable angle towards the floor, just beyond the tip of the nose. Soften the gaze. And while the breath remains in your field of awareness, now the main object of shamatha is that of the space or domain of the mind. So let the vision be soft and broad, not staring at anything in particular. Feel as if you were gazing into the space of the mind itself. Thoughts arise and pass like clouds appearing and dissolving within that sky of the mind immaterial, appearing yet empty of solidity. Allow the mind to settle in its natural state, free of grasping, free of distraction. The natural state of the mind is limpid, still, illuminated by awareness. Last week it was asked, how do I know I'm doing this practice right? So the signs of shamatha appear, and that's when you know you're on the right scent. And these signs of shamatha, of course, are concentration, single-pointedness, a calm abiding, undistracted by the thoughts or sensations that arise within your field of perception. There's a continuous presence. And there are three main aspects or sensations, experiences that arise when this happens, when shamatha happens. Bliss, clarity, and non-conceptuality. So you may have experiences of pleasure, of bliss, of ease. You may have experiences of clarity, luminosity. The term is selwa. It's a luminosity, a limpid, clear, and luminous quality of mind. And the third is mitokpa, non-conceptuality. You're not pulled, enslaved by thoughts. Attachments, aversions have no power over you. De sel mitokpa. De is bliss, sel is clarity, mitokpa is non conceptuality. Continue to release grasping or fixation and clinging with the out-breath and open into that spacious quality of mind.
begin to close your eyes again, resting them, and feel the breath traveling directly in and out from the heart space. This focal point, this center of your universe, this feeling of home in the heart. Breathing in and breathing out from the heart center, right at the center of the sternum. And become aware of something that's already there, which is a little luminous orb of light. Not too big, not too small, just uh, maybe the size of a little plum. A luminous orb of light. Might be golden. Might be another color. And breathe in and out from this luminous orb of light. This is the essence of your consciousness and your bodhicitta, your heart, compassionate, awakened, wisdom, nature. With each in-breath, you aerate and oxygenate that area of the heart space. Breathe out, opening that capacity, letting that luminosity glow even brighter, like an ember within you. This orb, this ember of luminosity at your heart center is the nature of your own mind is said to be indestructible. Like a diamond. As we practice the Donglen, the sending and receiving, we know that this, this luminosity at the heart space cannot be tainted or sullied or hurt by anything. And therefore, we have this courage of the Bodhisattva to stretch into a greater capacity of breathing in the hardships, breathing out the remedies. So we take in that which we would normally push away, and we offer what we would normally keep for ourselves. Let's start with ourselves for about 10 breaths now, feeling into anything that would like to come home, any hardship, rejection, anger, fear, sadness, anything. And feel it and invite it in with the in-breath into this orb of light at your heart. Let it come home. And as you breathe out, you integrate that, transmute it into the remedy. So if you're breathing in anger, you might breathe out space or patience or tolerance. And let it be somatic. Feel this in your body. Inhaling, bringing it home to the heart. Exhaling it, letting it integrate and transform through the release of the resistance. Release the resistance with the out-breath.
notice the internal atmosphere now, even after about 10 breaths of just simply breathing in what we would normally push away and releasing the resistance of that with the out breath, integrating it. How do you feel? Now bring to mind a loved one. Let the mind roam a little and take a moment to really land on someone that you would like to work with. A loved one, someone towards whom you feel quite connected and see them in your mind's eye as clearly as you can, perhaps seeing them the way you saw them last. They're facing you. And you can imagine any uh, hardship or challenge, suffering that they may have is surrounding them like a cloud of smoke with the in-breath, breathing in whatever ails them into your heart space, transforming that into the remedy as you breathe out, offer a cool, clear breeze to blow that cloud of suffering away. Give them the gift of your care, your compassion, your attention. Inhale, if it helps to say a phrase, you could make one up or internally just say I'm breathing in your pain I'm breathing out release from pain about ten breaths like this with each breath that cloudy suffering around them diminishes lightens, brightens and clears away as you breathe out, a prayer of healing, of release. see this person completely released and manifesting their full flourishing in their life. If they were hindered by illness, see them uplifted and free of that illness. Whatever it comes to your imagination, really see them in their full flourishing. and releasing that. And now 
We're going to take a step more deeply into the Donglen. Many of us have been practicing for quite some time, some familiarity. If you're new, then just hold this lightly and do as much as it feels comfortable to you. If at any time it feels like too much, then ease off and just do self Tonglen, yeah, what we did in the beginning. So now I would like to invite you to bring to mind a so-called enemy. It can be an individual, it can be a group of people. I would even invite you to bring to mind the people, the beings who have been perpetuating recent uh, sources of suffering, yeah? Because with Tonglen, we're working towards even being able to do this practice with our so-called, the people we don't like, the ones we despise, we judge, we s may even hate. So bring to mind a person or a group of people and recognize that just like you, they are looking for freedom from suffering. They wish to be free from suffering. They just might be confused about the way to go about it. And see their confusion, delusion surrounding them like a cloud of smoke. And in that mutual recognition that they wish to be free of suffering, they just might be hindered by veils of perception, confusion, ignorance, Make the aspiration that with the in-breath you breathe their suffering, their confusion into that indestructible nature of the mind, your heart space. Transform it and breathe out a cool, clear breeze, diffusing that cloud around and within them, offering clarity, wisdom, compassion, understanding, whatever it comes to you that might be the remedy. Do about 10 breaths like this, working with our so-called enemies in the spirit of building a bridge, whether it's just an internal bridge within us. See if you can step towards that with the Donglen. Taking those that we would normally despise, objectify, turning towards them and breathing in their suffering with the in-breath, breathing out the remedy, clarity, freedom from suffering with the out-breath. Now really feel this person or people or group completely free of the shackles of delusion and coming into the light, the full flourishing goodness. Nonviolence.
they wish that for them. Releasing now the visualization and just rest with some breaths, wishing this for the whole world, all beings who live on this beautiful planet and beyond. May all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings experience equanimity, free of attachment and aversion. And may all beings experience joy, unhindered by the sorrow of this world. And then just release everything and rest in the nature of awareness for a few moments. Just rest. Let's close with the dedication of merit for the benefit of all. Thank you. So now let's come back together. And uh, open to uh, any sharing or questions, comments about the practice that we just did. This kind of three-part session we started with. This kind of simple breath awareness, shamatha, right? Coming home with the breath, maybe using a little phrase. Uh, it's the first time I've offered a phrase from Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, I, I've arrived, I'm home. How did that feel to you? Then maybe after about 10 minutes, then we did about 10 minutes of settling the mind in its natural state where we took the mind itself as the object of meditation, the space of the do domain of the mind. How did that feel? And then for the last 10 minutes or so, we worked with the Donglen, the compassion practice that's so important and such an important aspect of Lojong, right? It's in taught in Lojong in the slogans. And it always says to start with yourself and then work out from there with others. And we did a, you know, conscious effort to, once we worked with self and a loved one, to expand into perhaps some very palpable material. I kind of touched in on last week because last Wednesday was the day of this uprising or insurgency on the capital. We were all in quite a bit of shock, shock and awe. And it, last Wednesday, I was not ready to practice Tonglen with those people, <laughs> you know. It's almost like we have to let ourselves be in our stages. And then as time went on, I started to go, come on, you know, why not? Let's see, Chandra, can you can you take a step? towards that. So that's why I wanted to invite invite you into that space tonight. I know a lot of us are re repeats, familiar faces, and we're deepening a lot together. And other people are new, which is great too. So I'd love to hear from you. I see Walt, you're unmuted. Would you like to share? Yeah, it wasn't you were meant to be. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> hey.
hey, maybe you're meant to share. Well, <laughs> always happy to hear from you. And if not, that's okay too. If somebody just wants to chat in something, you can do a chat or you can unmute and say something. You know, we're not a huge group. I feel like as every week goes by, we get to know each other more. We have a sense of community, sharing. It's okay. <laughs> Chandra, I have a Good. question slash share. Yeah. Um, with Tonglen, it's always a little bit um, not hard for me because the vis I can do, you know, like the visualization comes pretty naturally, but I find myself like, I, and it happens with me with Meta too, that like I almost feel like I'm white knuckling it. Like I'm so mm -hmm. desperately want the 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 thing that I'm sending out to be effective and true. Like you know, like especially that last portion. And I'm thinking I was just like imagining the scene in front of the Capitol and like I'm so desperate to have greed, hatred, and delusion transform, even my own, you know, definitely my own, that I think that I'm like grasping way too tightly to the practice. Or there's, there's, it's not the no hope of fruition practice for me at all. It's the, <laughs> it's, it's the opposite practice. And so, like, I don't know, like, is that, should I, I don't know. I'm putting it out there as a, statement and then maybe a question about like should i be doing it I, I guess and then i beat myself up like the second layer of that is then i beat myself up for like not being spiritually mature enough for understanding the true nature of whatever wisdom compassion impermanence equanimity blah 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 mm. Yeah, no, blah. It's a good blah, blah, blah. Or as Scott said the other night, a bloop, bloop, bloop. <laughs> you could laugh at that. Mace, I've known you for a long time, and I love um, the passion that you bring to this practice, and I feel your passion in that question, too. And I feel, you know, the passion is is your gift that you bring to your life, to your students, to your practice. So you, your practice might not look like mine or somebody with a different constitution, a different um, ratio, you know, of passion or, or the heart, you know, versus mind or however you want to say it. Uh, you've got both. I'm not saying you don't have a mind. I'm just saying, you know, you, and you feel things really strongly. And so I want to help you uh, make this your own, you know, where you know that that feeling, that white knuckling is actually like you can integrate that and use that because it's chi, you know, it's energy. And, you know, like in Tantra, it's all about transmuting energy. It's not about making it go away or even... Uh, being good versus bad, you know, really in that place of like no hope, it, it, we go beyond that. And I know that's hard to do. So when the white knuckling, you know, could there be a little humor in there? Like, oh yeah, there I am again, white knuckling, you know, even like relax your hands and remind yourself that you've been doing this practice, not just in this lifetime, but in countless lifetimes right and so because of that it's not all going to get done in this it might not get all done this time in this sit or this life even and then and then there needs to be a reckoning and a, a and a and a coming home to that in your own way so that there can be like you can be off the hook you're still doing it with the same amount of gusto and passion but there can be some enjoyment in that, even in the tragedy of, you know, working with people like the people who are totally delusional right now, storming the Capitol and doing horrible things. Yeah. 
Yeah. How is that landing? Is that okay? Mm, super tender. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Don't harden that tenderness. That's your gift. So I feel like the white knuckling is is the what you learned how you learned to manage that probably as a child or whenever right we learn those things so see that as your path like actually enter into that white knuckling like okay whew, that's my gift and then find the the diamond in that mm. don't make the white knuckling go away yeah mm. I'm gonna I'm gonna roll this around for a little while yeah yeah of course Thank you make it your own. Yeah. Yeah, good, beautiful question. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question, Chandra. Yeah, Jason. Um, I've been exploring a lot of metta this week and uh, kind of an ongoing retreat that's happening with my son and family. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious if you can help me understand, maybe just go over a little bit like metta and Tonglen and how they kind of, emerge they seem to be the same thing but they there's slight variation I, I don't know I just want to kind of get a bit more detail about how these practices yeah. are similar and maybe mm -hmm. compare and contrast a little bit yeah so you, you're familiar with the four immeasurables yes or the Brahma Viharas in mm -hmm. more of the Vipassana tradition right which are love compassion equanimity and joy or joy and equanimity. The Tibetans put equanimity first and practice equanimity first, but the classic early foundational teachings say love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And so metta is a meditation practice for m metta, <laughs> for love, for friendliness, really. Maitri or metta means a sense of friendliness and love and care. So metta in a sense is is simply like it's like the out breath. It's the breathing out, may you be well, may you be free from suffering, may you be free from harm. Whatever metta phrases you learn, you like, you can even make up your own. It's the out breath. The second of the four immeasurables or the four the Brahma Viharas is compassion, karuna. And Tonglen is a practice for compassion. Okay, and so with Donglen, we build on the metta because there's the out breath, may you be free of suffering. I'm giving you, you know, I'm offering that to you. But it adds a bit more edginess to it with the invite telling us to say, well, you can also breathe in the hardships of the, of the other out there. And so one's not better than the other. But I'd say metta is better for beginners because it's not, does, the, high, the stakes aren't as high. And it's important to understand emptiness before you do Donglen. Because if you're stuck in solidity and like, I'm over here and you're out there and then I'm supposed to breathe in your shit and, you know, oh, I'm going to get dirty and like sick. You know, why would I do that? But if you understand emptiness and you understand that there's no, f there needs, need not be any fear there because there's really no inherent me over here and you over there anyway. And also, this is all kind of aspirational, metaphoric. And our orb of light at, at the heart, our bodhicitta is indestructible anyway. It's a vajra, adamantine, indestructible. So that's, that's karuna, is often done thonglen. It's more of a Mahayana practice that developed and then went into Tibet, but it developed in, they say Atisha, who was Indian, an Indian Buddhist Mahayana master, learned this from his teacher in um, Indonesia, these practices, the Lojong slogans, uh, Thonglen. And then he came back to India for a while and then accepted the invitation from a Tibetan king to bring his teachings up to Tibet and brought them up there. So Thonglen is definitely more of a Mahayana phase practice. And so then you also have practices for joy and equanimity, mudita. And what do you think the practice is for joy? We're going to talk about this tonight. Joy, in particular, the practice is to rejoice in the welfare of others, the good fortune of others. 
So when somebody wins the lottery, instead of going, oh my God, I'm so jealous. Instead, you rejoice. Rejoice in the good fortune of others, whether large or small. You know them, you don't know them. And then equanimity is, of course, you know, trying not to prefer people and things one more than the other, having a, a quality of, um, say, one taste. So we're going to go deeper into this when we get into the slogan, actually, because the slogan talks about working with challenging emotions and their remedies. And a lot, and these four measurables are the remedies. So does that answer your question? That's fantastic. Yeah, I, I think okay. I, I, I never was as clear about how it all fits together into the four Bra yeah. Brahma Viharas. Is that how you say it? Yeah, Brahma, Brahma Viharas. Brahma, Brahma Vihara. means like divinity or divine. Mm -hmm. Vihara means abode. So the divine abode, yeah. beautiful name, right? Yeah. And then he, later in Mahayana, they became known as the four immeasurables or the Tsemeji in Tibetan. Ji is for Tseme, it means without measure. So we're cultivating immeasurable love, immeasurable compassion, immeasurable e joy, immeasurable equanimity, not just a limited amount for the people we want to give them to. <laughs> And that's the bodhisattva training. It's mm. Four measurables are part of the bodhisattva path. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. I see some chats came in. Um, Claudia said, I loved, I've arrived, I'm home. Good. It felt like a mantra. It is like a mantra that helped me concentrate and really appreciate how it felt to be home in the relaxed body. Great. It's hard to do Tonglen towards those people in DC, but I often think about their delusion, attachment, and aversion. I feel sorry because I feel he must be so miserable. Uh huh. Yeah, it's like that. It's like they're suffering too, right? The people, when they're burning up with anger, there's not a lot of happiness in there either. It doesn't mean we roll over and play dead or we abide things, but this is a spiritual practice, right? So we cultivate these qualities within us so that then our activism, whatever it is, or our conversations, whatever we do out there can be more grounded and whole and less destructive for us and them. Uh, thank you, Claudia. That's great. And Victoria, I love your share question. <laughs> yeah. Eric says, this has been a beautiful practice. Thank you, Chandra. I'm leaving with a heart holding just a little more wisdom. Thank you and love to the Sangha. Thank you, Eric. Must have had to drop off. Um, Claudia, I'm reading The Warmth of Other Suns. Beautiful book about the great migration from the South. And th though there's been some improvement in terms of racism and desegregation, I feel some things I haven't really ch haven't really changed. And it feels so frustrating. How can we change people's hearts? Prejudice and racism don't change by decree. There needs to be a massive acknowledgement and reconciliation in the spirit of, of Mandela. Yes, well said. I agree. And this book is fabulous. I have read it too. It's an important part of all of our journey and uh, learning an aspect of our history. Jim Crow and the great migration of black Americans out of the South into other parts of the country looking for better lives, and not necessarily always finding it. An important book by um, Isabel Wilkerson, who also wrote Cast. Now that is a very important book right now. I mean, I hope she goes back and writes an epilogue or an additional chapter after this whole fiasco, because it's just, a, it's, 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 it's a full, um, kind of proof of what it is she's been she talks about in that book cast it's it's just a really great how many people have read cast okay you've got to read cast my friends it's really good i got it up on tape i like to take walks and listen and um wonderful reading of it cast by isabel will Kirsten, I think I spelled that right, uh, talks about how we have a caste system here in the United States. And it talks about the link between India. So it's interesting in terms of Buddhism to think about that, but also linked to Germany 
the whole Nazi movement. So it's very timely, and we, we it's a good book, very important. Okay, um, well, it says, I've been struggling with the idea of working with allies for transformative change, believing that the root of the current unrest in this country is the fear by some of the loss of white patriarchal privilege, right? Liberal or even radical white people can run and hide when the going gets tough. I've got my family, safety, my job, etc. to be concerned about. Who will have my back? Of course, BLM allies this summer in the face of police brutality was a counterpoint to my concerns. Yes, there were some good and um, good white people out there doing the right thing. And it's true, as a white person, I'm also finding ways to not just stay comfortable because it's not my problem. It is my problem, too. And I think we all, those of us who are white, you know, in our life or white passing or have certain kinds of privileges, it's if we're really walking the bodhisattva path, we need to find ways to to help and to speak out, whether it's having conversations with your friends and family, whether it's reading books, getting educated, taking classes. It's actually like, it's it's an imperative right now. Like we don't really have a choice. That's my opinion. And of course, you know, we try not to get overly political here, but I don't think this is just about politics. This is about liberation. It's about liberation. Like what is liberation? If it's not about Walt, you know, if it's not about our brothers and sisters who might not look like us. So Radical Dharma is a very good, good book. It talks a lot about this. And what, what I love, Lama, what Lama Rod, who's a black um, queer Dharma teacher from the Vajrayana tradition, um, we talked about him last week, but he talks about how sanghas, you know, that aren't very diverse, ra- he doesn't, he says, rather than talking about wanting, rather than talking about how do we make our sangha more diverse? How would we become a more welcoming place? What Lama Rod says is he wants to see white people turn that focus back in on themselves and explore and heal our white body trauma because we also carry trauma growing up and living in a racist white supremacy culture. And then we can come and start making more bridges from a wholesome, really whole, good place where we're less likely to spout microaggressions unknowingly or assume things that we have no right assuming. But because our culture taught us that, we we do it. You know, we think we're we think we're liberal. We think we're woke. Um, so I thought that was really powerful for him to say. You know, white people, please heal your white body trauma that you also carry from swimming in in a white supremacy culture. And that's not selfish. That's like an African-American man saying, white people, you need to do that and then come talk to me. (laughs) You know, (laughs) I don't know. But I mean, that made a lot of sense to me. And a part of that, this is what came to me from Walt's comment, is about going to the places that scare us. It's not about being comfortable. You know, oh, I want to turn that documentary off because it's making me uncomfortable. Oh, I don't want to read that book because it's going to make me cry. Oh, I don't want to watch the news because, or I don't want to do this because I make, I don't like the way I feel. Like how often as people of privilege, do we turn away what we need to turn towards because we want our comfort zone to stay as it is? Like there's no more of that. We can't do that anymore. I'm sorry, but it's true. And Tonglen is training us to do this. You see what I mean? We can turn towards and alchemize, if that's a word, transform the discomfort, the sadness, the heartbreak, the guilt, the shame, the disillusionment, the numbness, whatever we feel around these issues, and heal that and work with it. Let's do it on next, in two weeks, feeding our demons around issues of white supremacy and Racism. We've been doing a lot of that work with the Tar Mandala Sangha. And um, it's important work to be done, no matter who who we are and what our experience is. So uh, maybe I'm going on too long about this. And I apologize if I am, but I think it's important. 
And thank you, Walt, for all for bringing this up and being so honest about your experience here. It's very important to have your voice in this community, in this work. Alex says, maybe we could tone the politics component down as someone in the Marxist anarchist socialist milieu. Some of these analyses seem naive to me. Love the meditation, first time doing Tonglen, but I don't come to these meetings for political analysis. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> I'm sorry, Alex. I, you know, your voice is also welcome here. And, you know, it is true that this is something that has really been up for me for, you know, more or less five years, actually. It's not brand new, but, you know, I'm always open to learning. I'm definitely uh, always learning and uh, appreciate your comment. Spiritual growth and transformation, Claudia says. Okay, good. So, one aspect of white supremacy is having to be perfect. <laughs> and uh, I really had gotten to reckon with that. And that's Dharma practice, you know, it's not too political. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not going to get it right every time, you know, and being a Dharma teacher for 20 years, I have really gotten it wrong a lot, you know, so, but I've also gotten it right a lot, and not needing to be perfect is a really great practice, and it's something we get to look at in the mirror every time we sit down and meditate, so, oh. Okay. Well, it says I should also acknowledge that in lots of other areas on a day to day basis, I also withhold my compassion and effort from people in situations that make me uncomfortable. Sure. Yeah, none of us are perfect. Thank you. There's a, a comment from Lucy above. Lucy, thank you for this space. I find so much difficulty in a healthy balance between self-care and laziness. Your teachings make me feel that this is the focused place to relax in a positive way without feeling guilt. Good. Good, good, good. Yeah. Yeah, the guilt is kind of like a bridge. Guilt or shame is kind of like a bridge feeling. It's it's important not to get stuck on the bridge, right? Like, okay, we can feel it, but then it can Im compel us to move forward, to do something about it. Especially that it can have to do with white guilt too, right? <laughs> like, okay, feel it, it's there. And then do something about it. Don't get stuck there. Okay, so now let's move on to the slogan number 27. Which is so apropos right now. I'll paste it in the chat. Work with the greatest defilements first. <laughs> or train with the strongest emotions first is another translation. I'd like to offer a third. But they're all pretty similar. The Tibetan is Nyonmong Gangche Nunla Jang. Nyonmong is the word for afflictive emotions. Nyonmong. Or in Sanskrit, it's Klesha. Nyonmong or Klesha in Sanskrit, which means afflictive emotions. Here they're translating it as defilements, which is fine. I don't love it. And um, then gang che is whatever is the greatest. So whatever is the greatest afflictive emotion. Ngun la jang. Ngun la means before. La is with. Jang means train. So train with. The f first train with whatever is the greatest mental affliction or emotional. Defilement is another way. Um, afflictive emotions is nyonmong, as opposed to mental 
afflictions, which is another category that we're not talking about tonight necessarily. So tonight we're really talking about more of the emotional patterns that block our experience of freedom. And so whatever is the strongest, work with them first. So you could also translate this as train with whatever is the greatest afflictive emotion first. Something like that. That's my offering of translation. So what are what do they mean here? So in Buddhist kind of thought, there are five main poisons. There are five poisons, but there are three primary ones. Ignorance, attachment, aversion. Those are the classic kind of root poisons that cause us to cycle around in samsara and to um, suffer. And then often two more are tagged on there. Pride, or you could say like arrogant pride, and then jealousy or envy is the fifth. Okay? So ignorance, attachment, aversion, pride, and envy. So these make up what are called the five poisons. And so as I'm talking, feel into like, what might be your greatest out of those five? <laughs> your greatest hit? Ignorance. So I'm going to talk, unpack each one and talk about the remedies for them in a moment. But we have to recognize that really most of our troubles come from when our mind is under some kind of influence of self-centered emotions. I didn't get that. I want that. You hurt me. Shanti Deva, the great Indian uh, sage, Buddhist teacher, said, All suffering in our lives comes from only thinking of ourselves. All joy comes from thinking of others. All suffering in our lives comes only from thinking of ourselves, or thinking of only ourselves. All joy comes from thinking of others. That's something to chew on for quite a while. <laughs> and really test that out for yourself. Like catch yourself mid-suffering and ask yourself, what am I thinking right now? Like what is causing me to suffer? I did that for a while and it was true. In my experience, it was true. Most of the suffering was coming from a, I, you know, I'm not happy, I, you know, whatever it was. It could be valid, but it's usually an I statement in there. And then thinking about like the joy that we get when we're actually turning f our focus towards others. How are you doing? What can I do for you? What can I give you? Oh, I'm rejoicing in your good fortune. And that's actually bringing me quite a bit of joy, too. There's a lightness of being that comes from that. And a good feeling like, like a, like a recharge that happens when we, when we help others, when we do good things. It's called positive karma. <laughs> it's like filling up your bank account with positive karma. You feel wealthy. <laughs> you feel good. What's interesting is that all the Buddhist schools teach that through shamatha, which is calm abiding meditation, that these kleshas are pacified they're calmed down, but they're not completely eradicated. So it's like they go dormant, but the seeds are still there. These seeds of these kleshas are still hibernating. So shamatha is good for temporarily pacifying them, but they don't make them go away. In order to fully transmute or eradicate, you could say, these kleshas, insight, vipassana, is needed. And what is the vipassana, this clear insight or deep seeing? It's seeing into the true nature, the true empty nature of these kleshas, that they appear, yet they're empty, of intrinsic existence. And we talked a lot about that within the first five slogans. Remember? The first five slogans of the Lojong slogans talk all about emptiness and insight. And so when we understand the nature of these kleshas to not be 
solid things in and of themselves. It's said that that is like a purifying effect that helps eradicate or uproot the roots or the seeds of the kleshas. When the empty nature of the mind and our sense of self is fully understood, there's really, there's no longer a root for these disturbing emotions to be attached to. And the disturbing emotions lose their power to overwhelm us. And so the first one, ignorance, you know, we might get through a couple of these and then Eve might finish them next week. But ignorance is really the root of the five because it's from ignorance that the other four stem and then a myriad of other ones. These aren't just the only afflictive emotions. I mean, there's infinite possibilities there. (laughs) And um, so ignorance is this root klesha. And the remedy of ignorance is understanding, is wisdom. Vipassana. It's the wisdom that comes from seeing into the, the way things exist, the way things truly are, which is interconnected, co-arising, appearing yet empty of solidity from their own side, meaning free, free of existing from their own side, that there's always a relationship, and therefore everything is interconnected and empty of intrinsic, independent existence. I hope that that makes sense. Yeah, we spend a lot of time with, remember how many people were here in the early days of the slogans here? First five, yeah. So this sounds familiar, right? Okay, if it doesn't, that's okay. You know, maybe this is intuitively making sense. Maybe it's brand new, like a foreign language. It it can take time to feel into this and to make it your own, if it's something that makes sense to you. Or if not, then that's okay too. So this word ignorance is avidya in Sanskrit. It's a not knowing. The Tibetan is marigpa, not knowing, not aware. Essentially, we don't know. What is it that we don't know, right? Essentially, we don't know our true nature, our Buddha nature, that basic goodness that we all have within us. So because we've forgotten, or we just don't know it, we flounder in the ocean of samsara is a classic phrase. We're kind of like floundering in the ocean of samsara. And how do do we develop understanding and wisdom? These classic kind of outline is first by hearing teachings, like hearing dharma or other truth-based, you know, kind of wisdom-based traditions. First, listening or reading can be in that. It's called tu. Then contemplating what you've heard or read. Contemplating it. Does that make sense? That's called sum. And then once you've done that and it does make sense and you're like, yeah, this is cool stuff, then you meditate on it. Then it drops down and from the intellect into the whole somatic knowing through integration and meditation. That's called gom. So tu sam gom is hearing, contemplating, and meditating on any topic. I mean, you could do this in the sciences. You could do this with art, language, philosophy. Learn something, chew on it, think about it, write about it, debate about it. And then, like, drop in, meditate on it. This is how, in the classic teachings, we develop wisdom or prajna. And so, within the Dharmic context, it's listening to the Dharma, thinking and ruminating, contemplating it, and then meditating on it. Then it becomes experiential, and no one can take it away from you, you know? You know. So the antidote or the remedy to ignorance is understanding and wisdom. And then I just talked, I just shared with you the kind of classic way that that happens, that you can go about that. And then when, so when we uproot that root of ignorance, then the self-clinging, that separate sense of self that we, 
you know, spend our whole life affirming, negating, defending, you know, propping up or tearing down, you know, whatever we tend to do with our ego and our sense of smaller sense of self, that starts to fall away. Because we realize, oh, that small sense of self is an illusion. It, it too is empty, right? And so by, by its very nature, then the other afflictive emotions, whether it's aversion, attachment, and so on, they have less solidity, they have less pull over us. They might still arise, but they don't intoxicate us in the same way. So then the next poison, so-called poison or klesha, afflictive emotion, <laughs> is attachment. Clinging is an interesting one. Clinging is kind of a good visual. Because we have attachment parenting. You know, there's a lot of hap uh, healthy ways that we attach to our parents, our kids, our family members, our friends. Like, that's fine. It's the kind of like, claustrophobic clinging or grasping is what in in the buddhism they're talking about here the sanskrit is raga r-a-g-a and the tibetan is duchak <laughs> two very different languages yeah but these are classic terms classic terms like even raga is something you see in hinduism and ayurveda and it's this quality of uh, that's not very spacious. It's a kind of a f over fixated, over clinging onto objects, people, experiences, being a certain way that you want them to be. Not a lot of space when the mind is attached and clinging in this kind of obsessive way. It might not feel so obsessive to you. There might be more subtle ways that this, this manifests in your life. But when we have more mental space, you know, less clinging, a bit more mental space, we can think about it when we want to. And w so we can think about the person or the thing or the experience when we want to. And then we can let it go when we don't want to think about it, right? I mean, I, I thought that was a helpful when I read that. I thought, yeah, that's true. You know, when you're obsessed with someone, like a new lover or a, somebody just broke up with you or you're really ruminating and suffering, when you're really stuck in clinging, y you don't have a choice <laughs> to think about them or not. You're just face planted in the thought. But when there's some spaciousness, when there's not all of that, clinging, you can choose to think or not to think, to feel th that or not to feel that. So when we're clinging, we're usually in a fearful state, um, a controlling state. It can be very exhausting and overwhelming. Has anybody felt these like this, this kind of fixation and clinging? Never. <laughs> Eric says, never. <laughs> Somebody, Laura, raises her hand. Good one. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Right. So we can all see ourselves in that. We're all human here. So the remedy is a, is actually the way um, one of the, my sources, Zigar Kongtro Rinpoche, uh, he wrote a book called The Intelligent Heart on the Lo Jong slogans. It's very nice. And he, he calls metta visionary love, which is cute. It's also a sense of good cheer, good friendliness, and love and care. But he says that this, the antidote, the remedy to clinging attachment is this kind of sense of visionary love, or you could say unconditional love, a bigger love, big love, big sky love. It's less self-centered, yeah? And it, what he says is it involves this quality of letting go. So when we say letting go, it's not about letting go of the thing, the object. It's about, it's, so it's not about the actual object. It's about letting go of the clinging onto that object. That's an important point. 
Yes, Jason says, is raga associated with uh, music? It is, because music brings about emotion and passion, and passion desire is an aspect of, of that kind of clinging, of, of this word raga. But it's kind of a positive connotation, of course. But it is connected. Passion. And so don't lump together this letting go of the object and the attachment. It's actually, when we're talking about letting go, we're talking about releasing that feeling of clinging. Letting go of that. It's like letting go of the claustrophobic controlling feeling. Because we can f we notice when you really look at it how grasping and clinging, uh, at being atta overly attached to things in our life, it can ca it causes suffering in our life for us. This can be the hardest klesha or afflictive emotion to overcome. Okay, it's not an easy one. But if we can be mindful of how it makes us feel when we're in it, again and again, how we all oh, this suffering, this doesn't feel good. This doesn't lead to the outcome I want <laughs> again and again. We can begin to uh, let go more and more. We feel it, we let go. We feel it, we let go. We're training that muscle. And then that allows us to be more spontaneous, more relaxed, more spacious in our life, in our relationships, and internally within us, our internal atmosphere, our mind and our heart, more space. So this visionary love, or you can say Maitri, this love, is a, a kind of a higher form of love. And as Lojong practitioners, we cultivate this kind of love for ourselves, for loved ones, and then extending it out to all, include all beings, including challenging ones. Yes, and that love can manifest as a form of non-attachment, which is different than detachment, right? So we're not cultivating a stark coldness. It's actually very warm and caring. Exactly. Non-attachment doesn't mean not loving. Yeah. So what's interesting is tying this back to the prior two slogans of don't ponder the faults of others and don't speak ill about others i'm paraphrasing when we do those things it's an indication that we're stuck in clinging actually that the, the, the if we were talking or thinking negatively about others remember one was speech one was mind those are little signposts hello investigate deeper here let that instigate a deeper investigation into what clashes are at work with us, within us, and then apply the remedy. So the remedy, what, let's just recap and then I'll close because we're at time almost. The remedy for ignorance is what? Wisdom. Understanding is another way of saying it. It's prajna. Understanding your nature and the nature of reality. What is the uh, antidote or the remedy for grasping attachment? Did you like visionary love? <laughs> it's a sweet phrase. I like it too. Yeah. It's that kind of generous love. Like, I don't own you, right? My love. And there's no end to that, to that kind of love. It's the kind of love if you have kids, you know, you, just because you have one more kid, it doesn't mean you've got to split your love in half. <laughs> you know, like this unending source of love in, in here. You don't have a limited supply. It's that kind of large love. Immeasurable love, in fact, which is the Brahma Vihara, the Tsemeji of love, Maitri or Metta. Okay. Good. So we're going to stop there and I'm going to tell Eve that she gets to pick up with aversion. <laughs> Lucky Eve. I know she was excited about teaching on this slogan. So I think it's good that we didn't have time to finish the whole thing because I'm sure she's going to have her wonderful spin on it too from her perspective. So she'll bring a lot to it next week. Um, the author to Intelligent Heart um, 
is obviously not easy for, for us to spell, so I'm going to spell it out in the chat. Zigar control. Intelligent art. It's a really nice, one of the more contemporary translations and um, commentaries. Zigar Kongtrul is was the partner from for many years. They had a child together uh, with Elizabeth Mattis Namgel, who's also written a wonderful book on emptiness. So if you want to get cozy and warm with uh, emptiness, I would get her book. And I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but you could Google her. She did seven years of, of solitary retreat while her son, their son, was young. But because her husband was a Rinpoche, he understood how to integrate deep practice with raising a family, and he supported her in that. So apparently their son would walk up the trail to her cabin in, in the woods in Colorado every day, I think, and spend his afternoons with her. She just wouldn't leave her cabin. It's just amazing. I have to admit, I felt jealous <laughs> when I heard that. I had jealousy. And then I got to feel that and be like, oh, I'm rejoicing. I'm rejoicing. My parenting experience was definitely not like that. <laughs> and I'm rejoicing in your good fortune. So it's opportunities like that when you hear people having what you would like. Great opportunities to practice empathetic joy. Mudita. Rejoice. Right. Thank you, Donna. Logic of Faith is a really nice book by Elizabeth M Mattis Namgyal. Yeah. Logic of Faith. Okay, my friends, thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening and a great week. And um, so appreciate you. Thank you for being patient with my uh, rants. And um, yeah, always open to your <laughs> feedback. Okay, some people liked it. <laughs> some people did that's great see hey i don't have to be perfect and guess what you don't have to be perfect either it's totally liberating and um keep doing what you're doing and we'll see you uh when we see you i'll see you in two weeks thank you please support the center we need everything we can get and yet your presence is the greatest gift and your practice is the best gift you can give to your teacher by the way so keep practicing <laughs> Dharma rants. Yeah. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Thank Big you. Big love. Thank you so much, Chandra. Oh, Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.